How's it going, everybody? Hassan Moore, founder of Accolade Sports Media here. It is it is episode two of my Totally Not a Podcast. It's rapidly turning into uh, a weekly thing. This might even happen more than weekly because I'm seeing some, some really interesting things happening in the NIL space that I want to address. No long intro today. Let's just jump into it. This is No Nonsense NIL Talking Points, episode two. Everywhere I look these days, I see the words true NIL. I see so many discussions online, uh, on Twitter, X, whatever you want to call it, on LinkedIn. I'm having these conversations on the phone. And this term, true NIL, has entered the lexicon probably probably on par with pay for play. Right Now we're using this term, true NIL. So... The first time I really paid attention to it because it was so obvious and so frequent was was during the January 18th congressional hearing uh, when Charlie Baker used it quite a few times. We'll kind of break it, break that down a little bit later. Um, but he, he essentially used it as a reference to Chase Griffin and said, oh, what Chase is doing, what Chase is describing, this is true NIL. And uh, Commissioner Jackson also made some references to, oh, you know, like there's NIL and then there's inducement, you know, trying to create this uh, this bicameral reality for, for NIL. Let's take a look at how this term, true NIL, in my opinion, you know, of course, you know, I'll, I'll try to bring some evidence to at least back the question here. But in my opinion, how this term is being used by the NCAA and, you know, their partners and their agenda uh, to push this concept that I really believe uh, aids in the self-preservation interests and regaining some of the power that was stripped away by the courts from the NCAA. Just hear me out, okay? I understand that we want to make some kind of distinction between obvious predatory behaviors that exist now and have existed in the past from all sorts of stakeholders and what NIL is supposed to be. I understand that. However, let's be very careful about how this term is framing the conversation. Before we even get to the words true NIL, I've noticed, especially when you really dig in deep into the congr last congressional hearing, there is sort of what I call the NCAA's conflation layer cake, right? And it's something that's kind of built through each statement and through the statements of people kind of allied with the NCAA's interests. And let, let, let's break that down. So the first is, these are s certain assumptions the NCAA wants us to believe are true uh, in order for the rest of their argument to make sense. So the first one I see is that there's true NIL and the true NIL is direct NIL, right? So it kind of cultivating this image that there's direct athlete engagement, and that's like the true and air quotes intended form of NIL. Um, and then they're also supporting this concept that NIL activity should be internal to the colleges and under governmental oversight, right? So already there, we're already starting to see like a, a strange uh, dichotomy, right? Like true NIL is athletes interacting with the market directly, but also we think that NIL uh, is it, it's in its best hands when it's in the hands of the educational institutions themselves and governmental oversight from this board that we're trying to put together now, right? So let's not even get into how weird that is. Secondly, what, what I call the, the second layer of this conflation layer cake is the verbal connection and correlation between collectives and either the literal term bad actors or some version of framing collectives as bad actors, right? We see this so frequently. Sometimes it's very subtle. We saw it throughout the entire hearing, through the last congressional hearing last week. Uh, we see it very frequently in the media, and we're going to break down a little bit as to you know how that's usually delivered. The third layer, which is connected to the first, is this concept of that the NCAA plus college, although they're trying to frame it as if college is really the one taking point on this, the college administration's taking point on this, is the best solution, right? That's the argument, is that NIL relationships, you know, we, we, you know there are all these different things, oh, because of Title IX, because of you know, legitimacy. There's so many different arguments, right? That this should be in the hands of the colleges. The colleges should be able to, you know, buy NIL rights with, you know, from athletes. That that's that's where that relationship should exist, right? And it's implying that like like any other solution is ridiculous. Like to think that anyone other than the colleges or 
or the NCAA, you know, in partnership with the colleges could do this is just ridiculous. It's not even worth addressing, right? So we have all these layers, and then they all they, they all kind of want to change the framework of the discussion to say, oh, well, these things that no one's really agreed on are, you know, this is just baseline. We all, we all agree that this, and we all agree that that, right? Is that true? Is it true that these three kind of foundations of their argument are undeniable? Let's take a look at a major problem with this argument, with the concept of it's obvious that colleges should be the ones to internalize this process. One of the major, one of the major issues with this that Representative Harshberger brought up during that congressional hearing is that the collectives, who a lot of this discussion is framed around, were entirely left out, ignored. Even the letter that was sent in ahead of time was not read or summarized in any way, being completely left out of this conversation. Um, collectives have been have been left out, and the positive effects, you know, the market share, what the collectives have already been what, uh, been able to accomplish, is being framed as insignificant. You know, on, on, in, it's either not being discussed at all, or you know, we kind of hear this logic of, oh well, like m most of what's going on is between athletes and brands directly anyway. So there's sort of either a you know sort of like di dismissive spin to collectives, or even when there's a direct question, we'll get into this later, on the, the positive effects of collectives, it, it's, it's unaddressed. The subject is, is you know, not even very subtly changed. When in reality, 80% of, of all NIL compensation has passed through collectives. So at the very least, we could include collectives in the conversation from the perspective of, you're a subject matter expert. Let's not even say who NIL air quotes belongs to, because when it comes down to it, and we'll get to that in the end of this, this is this really has to be an athlete-driven process, right? But even just from the perspective of, hey, you know, what has occurred in the past three years? What what information do the collectives have that could be useful in this discussion? Even that is is completely off the table, and that's very much by design. And if you don't believe me that this is by design, let's talk a little bit about the language surrounding collectives, even in this last hearing, right? So I, I encourage all of you to go and watch it. It's like three and a half hours long, but it's worth watching. Um, when rep I'll kind of go through this chronologically, you know, it, you know, who said what, even when the term collectives came up, and uh, I'll send you timestamps if you need these. Um, so Representative Rogers, immediately after mentioning collectives brought up the term bad actors which is something that we hear quite a bit that sentence bad actors the same sentence the same breath uh and told a story uh about you know some predatory fine print between a collective and an athlete and then just moved on to something else right so then president baker as one would expect did something similar you know collectives came up Immediately, the first thing we hear about collectives, and we don't, you know, we don't hear any any kind of positive force whatsoever. The first thing we hear is that ninety percent of NIL money is going to men, right? So we're already framing this as that the the collectives are creating uh, an unfair environment, right? And even when um, Representative Fulger asked a direct question about collectives' accomplishments, President Baker just sidestepped it and essentially started talking about the direct relationship that needs to exist between colleges and athletes didn't even address it so representative castor in in reference to collectives on that topic said that collectives have quote confounded what we hoped like what we hoped for with college sports and later in the same sentence made reference to fraud how you know like first off there's there's this concept of like all collectives are built equally and all of them are bad actors and all of them are getting in the way of what we all intended for college sports. First off, who's we and intended what? The NCAA never intended for athletes to be paid. The NCAA was shocked that they lost in the Supreme Court, right? So what they intended, we're going off of what the NCAA intended, or, or who, the colleges, what the colleges intended, or considering the person speaking is Congress, what Congress intended, Congress intended for what to happen in college sports. Seriously, like, what, like what's the answer to that? Um, you know, even from the athletes themselves, um, when Kiki Thal talked about collectives sentence, you know, that sentence had the terms disloyal organizations. She made reference to fraud. And in um, I don't want to make any any assumptions about uh, where where people's ideologies coming from. But in her own statement, she said, 
you know, based on what President Baker said and then went on to talk about collectives. So we know where we know where that information's coming from, where that perspective's coming from. Um, Chase Griffin, I thought, was a little bit more neutral. Uh, he did reference that all we hear in the press are the horror stories of collectives. OK, I agree with that. That's true. Uh, he made reference to that collectives are essentially startups uh, and that, you know, startups you know good startups last you know the get get through the test of time and bad startups fall apart okay sure i agree with that too um but i think that even his statement is being uh skewed a bit in the press and you know even by some people kind of affiliated with the ncaa to take the term startup and conflate it with the term like upstart you know like we have this very stable age-old institution in the ncaa and we have the colleges that you know, these are these are stable. These these are your your pillars of granite. Right. And then we have all these new upstarts or startups that are entering the space and don't know what they're doing. OK, listen to me. The the NCAA is a hundred and what, eighteen hundred and nineteen years old and is zero for three in court on antitrust violations. So something being more established does not make it more fair. So if we're going to if we're going to measure collectives, we can't measure them just based on the time that has passed. We have to measure just like we measure anything else on a case by case basis based on how it has performed in the market and how it is how it has treated other stakeholders. I'm sorry, like, is that crazy? I don't know. Um, so, yeah, Representative Harshberger made uh, the statement of like, why aren't collectives present? If we're thinking about regulating them, why aren't they having some say? Okay, great. Um, Representative Tran made a reference to the fact that the legislation that she penned with Representative Murphy uh, would create gender equality within collectives. So this kind of concept of, okay, like we need to find a Title IX-esque solution for collectives. Sure, I agree, right? But to argue that collectives should be left out of the conversation or left out of the future of NIL because we need to move this into the colleges in order to have Title IX protections what is what is preventing collectives whether they're associated you know through through the collective association through another association or even just themselves doing it on an ethical basis from creating the same balances and standards that exist in title IX? there's nothing that these are companies that can institute those policies and i don't understand the logic of that the only place you can find gender equality is by giving the nil process back to colleges it's it's preposterous it's you know and and then the last kind of the last reference here too was from representative fulger who made reference to the great work the collectives have done in texas you know he brought up the matador collective and he said they were doing a great job and asked a direct question asked a direct question to president baker about hey this collective is doing a great job can you talk to us about some of the other you know positive effects of collectives and immediately that conversation was spun literally the first sentence President Baker was able to spin that into a conversation about why colleges should be the ones doing it. Like, <laughs> like you, you, you can't make this up. You can't make this up. And then I thought this was one. I, you know, some people are going to say that I'm, uh, that I'm splitting hairs or that I'm being conspiratorial here. But again, come on. Like, President Baker was a governor. All right. He, and yes, everyone can have you know, Freudian slips, slips of the tongue, they can like not mean things. But like, let's be real, he meant this one, right? So when he was asked about uh, fraudulent and deceptive activity in the market, President Baker made reference to third parties, he didn't say the word collectives, but he's talking about where are these bad actors made reference to third parties. And he said that they were collecting names, uh, and then creating some kind of nefarious or negative system after that. It is not by accident, that if you if you don't want to say the word collective, that you say third parties and in the same sentence say collecting. All right. I've been a salesperson for a very, very long time. I know that you can uh, you can inception <laughs> certain words into people's minds by just saying words that kind of sound like them. Like that's half of what sloganeering is. <laughs> so you guys read into that whatever you want. Let's talk about the term bad actors. I came into this wanting to talk about true NIL, but let's talk about the other side of the coin. Bad actors has entered the conversation. Bad actors has now become essential to a lot of the arguments being made by different stakeholders in this debate. Let's let's look at some let's look at some bad actors if we want to talk about bad actors. The the NCAA is 
you know, kind of making this position that, hey, we need to, quote, reestablish equilibrium, right? And that the best place to reestablish equilibrium is in colleges having direct relationships ar around NIL with athletes and in the creation of this, like, pseudo-governmental board full of you know, as, as Chase Griffin said, political appointees, right? Like these, these aren't even sports people. These, and, and, and what powers do they have? Like, so ba bad actors, the NCAA is claiming that that's the only solution. Um, and they argue that colleges should control the process in order to be, quote, more transparent and more legitimate. But what is that characterization based on? What, what, what in the past makes us think that this will be a more transparent and legitimate process if college administration is in charge of this or if a board of political appointees is in charge of it? What, what historical uh, precedent is there to say that that will be a more transparent and legitimate process, right? And this is the, the craziest part of all of that is that we're having these deep three and a half hour long conversations about this and there's not even any mention not like nothing, no mention of the fact that the NCAA, who's being framed in these conversations as the leaders of reform, were the ones that conducted these practices for decades that limited the financial capabilities of athletes that, you know, these, these organizations in this discussion, tell, you know, telling us who the bad actors are, have uh, enriched themselves off of athletes without sharing in you know in that growing wealth and are we going to ignore the the antitrust violations and potentially other forms of violations that the ncaa has has committed over the years are we going to ignore the number of financial scandals that we've had in academic institutions are we, we're, we're going to remove those things from the conversation of who in the equation may or may not be a bad actor are we are we making the assumption that every collective in the market is potentially a bad actor or is actively a bad actor. But institutions that have long histories of financial scandals and an institution that, again, I will go back to this, is 0-3 in court when it comes to antitrust violations, that those two groups are the ones that are best suited to tell us who is a bad actor in the market. Let's break that down. So I was shocked. I was shocked at how little the antitrust exemption was being discussed during this hearing. The hearing was about, we talked a lot about whether or not athletes should be employees. We talked a lot about what sort of resources athletes should have. We kind of danced around the concepts of who should be in charge. We danced around the concepts of whether or not this legislation is the right legislation and what else should exist. We use the term true NIL eight times. We use the term not employees or some version of talking about not employees seven times. But one of the most critical things being discussed, antitrust exemption for the NCAA, was only mentioned three times. And in one of those times, um, Representative, I believe it was Representative Kamek, said, oh, we're dancing around the issue of antitrust exemption and then just went on and completed her sentence. And like, <laughs> and then it was never referenced again. Yeah, why are we dancing around the idea that this is actually about antitrust exemption? What's going on, right? There, there were a lot of, uh, to use a term from earlier, uh, confounding elements. Um, one of them, so we had uh, Representative Allen of Georgia, was, in, was including and was not the only one to include outright calls for a, re a return to amateurism, a return to normalcy, right? There were actually 13 references throughout that hearing in the present tense that referred to athletes as amateurs, even though, hey, 2021 killed that. Amateurism's over. And I'll, I'll do a video later talking about that because I don't understand why it's, you know, it's still being pitched as this concept of, oh, you know, like things, things are just so crazy right now. And if only we could get back to good, sweet, wholesome amateurism when no one was getting paid, you know, except for the administrators, the NCAA, the coaches, 
and literally everyone except the athletes. If only we can get back to the good, wholesome days when money wasn't involved. From Representative Allen of Georgia with a net worth of $52 million. <laughs> We gotta we gotta get money out of sports, but it's okay for for you to have fifty plus million dollars and and uh and represent the the state of Georgia and government because money money doesn't affect that, but money will affect you as an athlete. We gotta we gotta get these kids back to what matters. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Charlie Baker Charlie Baker made this reference. To that college athletics is the greatest human development tool in the world. And I agree with him. I agree. 100%. Um, but what has the NCAA done with that tool? I, you know, I'll make reference to this over and over again. J just like how you know, the term bad actors is being used as much as humanly possible. Uh, true NIL is being used just as much as possible. You know, let's, I, I, want, I, w I want us to start using the term 0 and 3. OK, because <laughs> I feel like everyone watching this knows this. But if you don't know this, this is the NCAA's track record. This the, the, the track record of the people establishing who bad actors are. Right. 1984 Board of Regents NCAA. The NCAA wanted to make sure that they had control over how often college sports is being broadcast on television for essentially two reasons. Uh, reason number one being that they were trying to protect ticket sales right let's let's let, let's take a moment to to truly deeply enjoy that too that even when the ncaa is attempting to control and restrict something for what they claim is protecting an industry that they're on the wrong side of that one too <laughs> because yeah absolutely ticket sales to the stadium that's much more important than the than the amount of money you could get from TV rights deals. Good call, NCAA. In 1984, you were really on top of what was going to make the big bucks. Crazy, right? So even in that case, they were incorrect in what should be regulated. And here we are again in 2024 talking about is the NCAA going to be correct on what needs to be regulated? They weren't right then. All right, fast forward, fast forward. 2015, right? The NCAA, and they made this argument in 84 too, right? Is saying, hey, amateurism is our product. We can't pay the athletes because them not being paid is a part of the product. That's why people are watching. People want to watch them and know that they're, that they're not professionals. These are amateurs. They're not getting paid. And look how good they are. That's the argument, right? Guess what? They lost that one too. They lost in 84. They lost in 2015. We come all the way up to 2021. And now they lose an NCAA v. Alston. They can't prevent athlete compensation. Amateurism is functionally <laughs> and hopefully permanently abolished. And the Board of Regents NCAA, where they sort of agreed that amateurism is a thing, erased, gone, right? That's done. Justice Kavanaugh said, hey, we can't even apply that, right? Because, and I, I highly recommend that you read his concurrence, it is baffling that an organization could claim, hey, not adequately <laughs> compensating people is what our brand is. <laughs> and and you're, you're, violating, you're violating the very nature of our brand by not allowing us to do the essential thing of not sharing all the billions of dollars we're making with the people on the field. <laughs> it's wild. It's really wild. And it gets better. Because the argument in 1984, the argument in 2015, the argument in 2021, the argument being made right now by people like Representative Allen, is that we need to make sure that college sports does not become professional. We hear this all the time. College sports has to be separate. We need to make sure that, that you know, we, we heard many times in this hearing, well, isn't that just professionalism? Aren't we just making college sports into professionalism? Okay. Okay, let's say that. Let's say that it is essential. I don't agree. But let's just, for the sake of this argument, say that it is essential that we keep college sports from becoming professional. Okay. So the NCAA and the colleges, when they were building professional-level stadiums and facilities, 
not a problem. The fact that a lo- that you know many of these SEC schools you know have stadiums better than some pro, okay, not a problem. We didn't care about bordering on professionalism then. We didn't care about bordering on professionalism when it came to the salaries of college administrators or NCAA officials or bonuses for them. We didn't care about it then. We didn't care about professionalism, about the payment of coaches. Didn't care then. We didn't care about bordering on professionalism right now at this very moment when the NCAA wants antitrust exemptions similar to the NBA and the NFL and Major League Baseball. So so we need to do whatever we can to prevent the athletes from experiencing an environment similar to professionalism, but it's okay for the organizations involved to have every benefit of professionalism (laughs) from compensation to antitrust. (laughs) You cannot write this. You cannot write this. I was a screenwriter for many, many years, and if I wrote this, I would not submit it because it's crazy. It's crazy. It's crazy to say our entire product is, it, you know, needs to be protected from professionalism while every other aspect except athletes is trending toward or already exists at a level of professionalism. Nuts. It's nuts. So how should we define true NIL? I would prefer that we stop even using the term, but I understand the sentiment behind it. And let's talk about let's talk about that. I believe that athletes and collectives are the two parts of this, right? Athletes need to be well-educated and well-informed, right? They need to have the baseline education of understanding the processes in front of them, and they need to be well-informed about the behaviors, the track record, and the potential of everything around them so that they can make smart decisions, plain and simple. Athletes should have access to a host of competing solutions. This, <laughs> before I even explain this, let's go to the next line. This era is about abolishing monopolistic systems that refuse to adapt or evolve due to a lack of competition. The reason why I say that we are going to need to find private sector solutions to this is because the last thing that needs to happen is for us to migrate this process into colleges, into whatever organizations they want to build in Congress, and for you to end up in a position where someone else has a monopoly on this behavior and you can't go to a competitor and get something better. I'm sorry. That's just that's just how it is, right? That's just to like to me that's a no-brainer. The last thing we need to do is consolidate choice at at this point. So, collectives as the most experienced in this new industry, literally have moved the most capital around, should be allowed to create those solutions. They should be competing with each other. To, to present the best possible product to athletes. You know, that, you know, Chase made this reference to the free market. Let's really talk about what that means in the free market. If, you know, if there are nine solutions out there, I agree with him that the better ones will rise to the top. Sure, right? But the, the best one that's at the top should have to defend its position by providing better quality resources, services to the students. I'm sorry. Like, to me, it's clear as day. Right. So and and this is kind of the biggest part. And I'll end on this. Collectives should not have to vacate the market or become subject to the same broken systems that controlled the old regime. What like what more can I say on that? Are we really in a position where not only who's defining the conversation, but who's saying what the solution should be and potentially even the solution itself that's going to be handed back? to the exact same people that caused the problem. Are we at a point in this discussion where we're going to let the foxes define the nature of hen house security? Really? Thanks for watching.